Hello, my fellow forgiven sinners. Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't be fooled by Christ's humility. We've begun this season of Advent and we're starting to look forward to celebrating Jesus' first coming when he was born in such humility, born to a poor carpenter and his newlywed wife, born in a stable because the, the hotels in town were all too full, born to live a life of poverty and, and, and weakness, seemingly. seemingly. He was born to, to be ridiculed, to spend his time with prostitutes, tax collectors, and sinners, the, the scum of society. And just like back then, because of that humility, many people today just don't think very much about Jesus. Sure, yeah, he did some stuff, but, I mean, what does that really have to do with the real important things in my life, right? But Jesus started something 2,000 years ago with his death and resurrection. And what Jesus started is going to culminate one day when he comes again a second time. And at that moment, no one will call Jesus humble. No one will call Jesus weak. No one will think that Jesus at that time is a non-issue. Now is the time to recognize that Jesus is coming as the King of and judge. Now is the time to, to humble ourselves so that we are ready for Jesus' glorious return. Today we're looking at 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 18 through 22 where the Apostle Peter points out this strange paradox of Jesus' humility and glory, this weakness and power which we see at his first coming. And so with those words we're going to prepare ourselves now for Jesus' second coming coming. In this section, we read about Jesus' humility at his first coming, but we also are going to see his glory during that time. And then Peter's going to point us to Jesus' glory and power in our lives right here and right now. Our lesson begins with Peter describing Jesus' humble first coming and the point of that humility that Jesus showed at that time. We read in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, because Christ also suffered once for sins in our place, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in flesh, but made alive in spirit. Here Peter very simply sums up Jesus' first coming. Jesus takes on our humanity, and he uses it to suffer. While Jesus had these world-changing powers, he healed diseases, he calmed storms, he raised dead people back to life. While Jesus taught world-changing lessons that millions of people all over the world, even today, still study all the time, Jesus seems almost incredibly weak as you look at him back in history. When you think about his life, I mean, think about that for a moment. He didn't conquer the world with a powerful army. He didn't start some new dynasty that ruled over nations for generations. Instead, he traveled around on this itty-bitty country for three short years. And then he gets arrested and killed. As you look at, at Roman history, he seems like just a small blip on the historical radar as far as what he actually accomplished during his life. He suffered just like any of us do. He dealt with evil and unjust rulers, just like any of us do. And for all the power that Jesus had, sometimes it seems like he really wasn't all that powerful at all. He's something that most people today feel they can just ignore. Do you believe that Jesus is powerful? Or do you believe that he's something that you can just ignore? I've confessed before uh, that I don't pray as much as I know I should. I just don't think about it. I have my daily tasks to do and I jump right off to, to do them without stopping even to ask God's blessings on those things that I'm going to do. A few weeks back, I was listening to a, a devotion which said, the reason that you don't pray is because you don't trust in God to accomplish good in the world. Instead, you trust more in your own ability to get things done. Those words hit me really hard. I don't pray because I don't believe that Jesus is powerful enough to actually help me. Now, if I was wise, I would recognize that nothing I aim to accomplish is going to get anywhere unless God himself blesses it. You see how powerful a temptation this is? Satan would like nothing more than for you and me to dismiss the power of Jesus. In fact, he's worked pretty hard in our culture to accomplish that. 
Even our churches are filled with images of Jesus as a rather weak figure. I mean, how much of our art portrays Jesus as this beautiful man with long hair that looks almost womanly? We have so many pictures of Jesus with little children on his lap or as a shepherd carrying little lambs. We have way more of those pictures than we do have pictures of Jesus as the almighty king of the universe before whom every, before whom every single knee will one day bow. And these popular images of Jesus, they, they really do not emphasize Jesus' power all that much. Now, don't get me wrong here. The problem with all of this is not that Jesus did say, let the little children come to me. The problem is not Jesus' description of himself as the good shepherd. The problem is not even an artist's desire to paint their Lord Jesus so that he looks good. Those are wonderful things. But the problem comes when we mistake Jesus' humility during his first coming with weakness. When we picture Jesus as weak, well, then why should I bother praying to him when I have to do things with my own power, right? If, if Jesus is so weak, why should I bother taking time out of my busy day to study what he says with my fellow Christians? If, if, if Jesus is so weak, why should I speak up when I have a chance to share my faith with someone else? What Do you see how this problem affects us? When you and I do not believe in Jesus' power, we quickly lose any reason to practice our faith at all. With a weak Jesus, I, I can keep him as, as sort of this just this genie in a bottle, right? I can keep him back on a shelf during most of my life, but just during those times when I'm really worried about something or, or when I'm feeling particularly guilty, then I can get Jesus out. I can listen to a few of his sweet promises, but just enough uh, so that I feel better and I can put him back in the jar and put him back on the shelf, right? That way, I mean, I don't have to worry about Jesus' call to, to love God with all all my heart, soul, strength, and mind. That way I don't have to worry about uh, repenting of my sins at all. I don't need to go through the discomfort of fearing, loving, and trusting in God above all things when I can instead fear, love, and trust in whatever I choose. I don't have to go through the, the discomfort of loving my neighbor as myself when I would instead choose to treat myself as the most important thing. I don't have to worry about confessing Christ in my daily life because, well, I mean, Jesus is just too weak to matter anyway, right? Do you see my point here? We cannot let each other see Jesus as weak. Because such a belief quickly leads us to ignore his commands and his will for our lives. Look again at our lesson from 1 Peter. The apostle Peter does not let us look at Jesus' first coming as something weak. Instead, the humility that we see is Jesus holding his almighty power back so that he might bring both justice and salvation to his creation. Peter writes in verses 19 through 21, in which he also went and made an announcement to the spirits in prison. These spirits disobeyed long ago when God's patience was waiting in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In this ark, a few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. And corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the guarantee of a good conscience before God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice what Jesus accomplished at his first uh, coming, according to Peter here. Peter describes Jesus' descent into hell. The scriptures explain to us that after Jesus defeated sin, death, and Satan, Jesus descended into hell to proclaim to the condemned, totally defeated forces of evil that he had absolutely obliterated them and there was not a thing that they could do about it. Think about a, a football player screaming in your face after uh, he's just juked past all the defenders for a touchdown, right? Peter brings up these waters of the flood. This is another weird thing that we, uh, we often have turned into something incredibly weak, Right? We have these cute little pictures of Noah on his tiny little boat that's just barely big enough for a giraffe, an elephant, and a lion, right? And we paint this picture on our nurseries, right? That's a very weak picture of what God did in that moment, right? In reality, the flood was a horrifying display of Jesus' power and justice as he unleashed his righteous anger on the horribly wicked people in Noah's day, giving them exactly what they deserved and stopping them con from continuing to destroy his creation with their evil. But now look at what Peter says about those awful waters. He connects those waters of the flood 
to your baptism. Peter connects that that brutal power of God to purge this evil, this world of evil, so that only eight people survived those waters. And Peter connects that brutal power to what God has done in your life through your baptism. You see, your baptism wasn't just some cute ceremony that your parents took pictures of a long time ago. Your baptism was God unleashing his power into your life to purge away the sin and evil in your own heart so that your sinful nature might drown in those holy waters of God's justice and that God might raise you now to a new life so that you now have eternal salvation by that very power of God. Your baptism is God's terrifying power to lead you through your life continuing to give you the ability and power to put your sinful desires to death every single day through sorrow and repentance, and so that you might daily be raised to live a new life, a life that recognizes the power of Jesus, not just when he comes again, but in every single moment of your life. And that is exactly how Peter ends our reading for today. He writes in verse 22, He went to heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. As Christians who have been put to death and raised to this new life through our baptism, we believe in the power of Jesus. We believe that even now, Jesus holds all power and authority in our lives and in the rest of the world. In fact, everything in your life right now, whether it's the worldwide pandemic that we're dealing with or evil and unjust rulers or or people who seek to harm and persecute you, all of them are subject to Jesus. In fact, even Satan himself cannot sneeze unless Jesus allows it. Jesus is the greatest power this world has ever known. And one day the entire world will recognize that when Jesus comes again in glory to raise all the dead and to judge all of humanity. On that day, the whole world will learn that Jesus' humility during his pursuit of our salvation was absolutely not weakness. It was him unleashing his power in ways that we are too weak to even imagine. One day the world will learn of Jesus' power. But as a Christian, you are blessed to know of Jesus' power right now. Let that knowledge fill our lives so that we trust in that power every single moment. Let that power teach us to begin our efforts with prayer because nothing we do will ever succeed without God's blessing. Let that power teach us to to pursue the, the powerful kingdom of God rather than the weak little kingdoms that we try to build for ourselves. Let the power of God teach us to make love for God our highest priority and love for our neighbor our second priority rather than just pursuing our own personal and selfish aims and goals. Let that power lead us to remember our baptisms and to live those baptisms every day as we repent and seek to do what our God desires. Amen.